Where it's not getting rubbed, so I don't know if you can maybe put your hair behind your shoulders that can just fall back out. I can't see anything. Here, can you put your hair back? The goal is that we just don't want anything rubbing on the mic because it'll go. Are you gonna keep your coat on? Probably. You guys might want to take your uh, your badges off though. It looks uh -oh. better without. Okay, get your badge off. Much better now. Yeah, now everybody, official. no one will be confused. These chairs are rolly and they're spinny, and it's so tempting because it's like, oh, so yeah, I can't go like this. Yeah, so we do ask, try not to roll around. Uh, it's like so, so tempting, and I'm putting my foot down for next year to have a static chair, so because it's, it's hard not to. Is there a restroom nearby? There mm -hmm. actually is, yes. Pop out right around the corner. Oh, I want to see Mike. Ah. I didn't do it. I don't like doing interviews. Really? Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty harmless. Pretty harmless. We'll see. We'll see. It's a weird experience, isn't it? I just, I don't know. My mic's always done them, and it's just, it's just. <laughs> you like to let the work speak for itself. And I like to kind of stay in the background. <laughs> Did you guys have a good concert? I didn't even know this was with me and him. I just thought it was him. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, you got dragged into it, basically. Well, I didn't know. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Ed McGinnis came up here yesterday, uh, two days ago. He goes, are you Jonah? Yeah. I didn't know I was supposed to do this. What do you mean? Nobody told you? Yeah, nobody told me until 15 minutes ago. And Ed never does interviews. He doesn't have a Facebook account. He doesn't do any of that stuff. I don't have Facebook. I have Twitter. I don't have See, you and Ed have a lot in common. <laughs> and Ed's like, I don't really want to do this. And uh, he says, but I'm told I'm supposed to since I'm against this show. And I will totally take care of you. Everybody, we are on day three so, yeah. of the con. I will take care of you. It'll be fun. Um, so we're going to get started really soon. Um, in just a moment, so I'm going to give you guys the room spiel. Please put your phones on silent or turn them off. Uh -oh. like that. I'm going to put mine on Oh yeah, I got it. Yeah, might be in it. Yeah. I, I've been told that many times. But uh, normally I try to steer clear of it, but it's problematic. Oh yeah, I told her about this. No problem. So that's it. Anyway, we're gonna get started soon. Talk about it. I've never done this show before. This is my first time up here. I've barely seen Seattle, but it's really? a nice show. Yeah, I love. Uh, well, I love Seattle, and um, this is an awesome show. I can't believe how big it is. We were here two years ago. And it was just like one room. Really? But I love it because it was just like pure comics. Right. It's like Baltimore. Baltimore was like just pure comics. <coughs> and um, no, it's a nice show. And I've known Jim Demonacos, the guy who runs it, for 15, 20 years before he even started this thing. And I remember second year he ran a show. He was down in Long Beach. It was, it was Wizard World Long Beach. We're actually doing Long Beach. Oh, are you? Well, this is the old Wizard World Long Beach, and oh. Wizard World was just starting to expand. And they 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 sought out Jim and said, "Look, just so you know." We're going to go into the Seattle market, and we're going to put you out of business. And Jim like sought me. I was like, dude, we gotta have we gotta have lunch. I'm freaking out. And I just told him, I said, look, just keep your head down, put on a good show. They can't touch you. Sure enough, they've never come into Seattle, and his show's grown to this. So the show's show. amazing. It's a great show. Hope it don't stink. I feel like I just spray cologne all over me. <laughs> 
All of a sudden, Mike's like, we gotta go. Why like right now? We're kind of like, what? <laughs> Comic-Cons are always a bit of hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And not a lot of relaxation. <laughs> you want to see my dog? <laughs> That's my dog. That's amazing. That's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Do I, do I look okay? You're always beautiful. Oh. Score. <laughs> <laughs> Tweeting has any effect at all? If like 20 minutes in, people start. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be pretty funny. Be a good experiment. Welcome to the Secret Origins Room. I'm Jonah Wyland from Comic Book Resource, and we are here at Emerald City Comic Con. Our first guests here on Sunday are the dynamic duo, I guess you'd say, of uh, art and, and coloring, Mike and Laura Allred. Thanks for coming out, guys. So. There's a million places we could start. You've been in this industry for a long time. You guys have been working together for a long time. But we're going to start at the, at the present, Silver Surfer number one, which I just read uh, on the flight up here. And I got to say, that Empiricon page, that double page spread, I, I understand it took you two days to do that. The coloring <laughs> on that must have been a nightmare. No, it was fun. Was it fun? <laughs> yeah. Why, why is something like that fun? It would just seem to me like, you have so many colors to do, it would just be No, he was actually, when he showed it to me, I think he was kind of afraid. He goes, you can maybe just like airbrush a little bit. And I go, no, I'm, I'm going to do it. And I had fun. Talk about the process of building that page, because that seemed like a behemoth. I want to start with you. It, for me, I just kind of went back to junior high mode, where you're sitting in the back of the class, and you're just, just there, and you just keep going on and on. Yeah. So I just had the basic shape, and I just started filling it all in. It was just uh, kind of like doodle. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to take um, craft paper, I don't know what you'd call it, where, like, it just had a bunch of boxes, and I'd make like little mazes, and it reminded me a lot of that, like making those really intricate mazes back then. Was there stuff that, is there hidden stuff in there that we haven't seen since it's on that small size of page, or? Um, uh, hidden stuff, sure. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's lots of hidden stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Hidden messages. No. Have you guys at Marvel, have you talked to Marvel about possibly a poster of that thing? Because I'd put that on my wall. I, somebody actually tweeted that this morning asking if there would be a poster. I said, well, just pull it out of the comic. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because totally it, it is right in the, in the staples. And then I tweeted Marvel, ask Marvel, so we'll have a poster without staple holes in it. That would be nice. That would yeah. be nice. Talk about the, the genesis of this project and working with Dan Slott. I, I mean, everybody has seen what Dan's done with Superior Spider-Man and how he made that comic both bizarre and even more engaging than ever before. And it seems like he's on his way to doing the same with uh, Silver Surfer. And I know you guys talked about it a lot when you started. Yeah. Talk about those conversations. Um, well, for me, it, 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 this may sound a, a bit self-serving, but it started um, with Tom Brevoort just asking me, would telling me that uh, there was a writer's uh, get-together and um, people were tr trying to pitch ideas for Silver Surfer and nothing was sticking. And uh, Dan just kind of went off with Tom and said, I kind of have an idea. He didn't want to really present it in the room. Mm -hmm. And Tom was, that's great. What about Mike Alra drawing it? And to which Dan said, it, it, he said, you know, self-serving, I'm sorry. <laughs> but he said it ruined it for everybody else, which I'm so very grateful for, because wow. he said he couldn't think of anybody else from that point on. And Tom asked if I would be interested, to which I was, are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, Silver Surfer is, uh, I, it, no secret, one of my all-time lifelong favorite characters. And, right. And uh, everyone who knows anything about me knows I'm a Kirby nut. And my favorite uh, comics, period, it, is the the Jack Kirby Fantastic Four run, and then you boil it down to my favorite story ever, and it's the Galactus Trilogy. And uh, you see my studio, and you just see a little <laughs> piece of evidence of that, you know, surfer figures and toys and, and uh, prints. And um, I have the second issue, which, uh, the, well, the, the first issue with Silver Surfer on the cover. Mm -hmm. the, his first appearance had the Watcher on the cover, but I have, uh, um, signed to the All Reds, Stanley, um, the, 
the actual comic framed inside a giant print of the first issue of his regular series, which John Buscema did. Yeah. So it's it's a shrine, and so I'm I'm living the life as far as I'm concerned. That's really cool. Yeah, it's it's so exciting seeing Mike so excited and and which revoking. never happens. <laughs> <laughs> Is that true? Is that true? Everything he's working on. Oh, this is this is so fun. This is amazing. And and then with Surfer, he just got more excited. It was just like, I, it's like, what can I can't take this? <laughs> I, quick question, Jack Kirby. Uh, I didn't learn to appreciate Jack Kirby until a little bit later uh, after I started collecting comics. I, I've been collecting comics for about twenty five years, and it took me about five years to appreciate Jack Kirby. You're a little bit older than me. Did you appreciate him from the beginning, or is that something you grew into? Uh, he, he, it, it, he was always there. My, my big brother, Lee, is actually here at the show. It's only the second comic book show he's ever been to. Hmm. And um, he's kind of, he, he can be a bit shy and reclusive. But, so it's been a lot of fun sharing all this with him. Um, because I wouldn't even know what a, a comic book was if it wasn't for him. Really? Yeah, one, one of my earliest memories in my life is uh, somehow he talked me into getting on top of a card table and then started shaking it telling me to dance. <laughs> and, uh, and he has no memory of this, by the way. <laughs> no, Lee has a memory of this. <laughs> <laughs> because the next thing I remember was waking up in the hospital. And, but when I woke up, um, it, there, you know, mom, dad, Lee, guilty look on his face. But the, the hospital bed was covered with comic books. Wow. Yeah, it's just, it's this magical memory. I don't remember the pain. So, but waking up and like the end of Wizard of Oz or something, and instead of people hanging in the window, there's comic books all over the, the bed. And, <laughs> and uh, he even asked him if, if he could, and this is why I know he remembers this, because I asked him what the, some of those comic books were, <laughs> and I've tried to repurchase them. But, but yeah, Lee um, always had the best taste, and so I grew up with it. So for me, it was a matter of... Uh, Acquiring a taste for Kirby, it was just my first exposure to what a comic book was supposed to be. Right. You know, and so. And for he had a friend that turned him on to the comics, right? Lee did, yeah. yeah. So if not for that accident, you may not be in comics today. Is that what you're kind of saying? Oh, I'm. No. But <laughs> without the accident, the comic comics were still there. Okay, they were. Still and okay. every time we would go on family trips, the, the parents would, you know, drop into the drugstore or the market and right. grab some comics, so we'd be quiet in the back seat, which we would. We'd just be, you know, comics all over him. Right. But Lee uh, always had the great, the best stuff. He just had this taste. And even when I would uh, veer off a little bit with uh, an issue of Hot Stuff or Casper, <laughs> um, I would then see what Lee had, and I want that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I would and um, go into his room and get into his stuff. But, yeah, I, so it was always there, yeah. and, and uh, I've always loved it. I've never... And also uh, later, uh, I kind of fell away from comics I in my teen years. Uh, um, actually, before that, when um, uh, Marvel killed Gwen Stacy, and it devastated me. You were done. Yeah. So it was actually um, uh, you had a newspaper out spending my money on record albums instead of comics at that point. But um, when I came back later, I was. I then passionately fell in love with the medium again, and this would have been like mid to late 80s. In fact, exactly that time was, Watchmen was almost finished in its original run. And um, a friend gave me Dark Knight Returns, and mm. Mr. X exposed to Hernandez Brothers, Love and Rockets. So as an adult, I kind of had this new romance with comics and found all of the stuff that people had now were considering to be the best was the stuff that I was surrounded with in comics. So I, I was exposed to Alex Toth and Steve Ditko and Bruno Premiani when I was a kid. I just didn't know. I didn't know their names. Right. And so this crash course as an adult um, just spurred on a passion that became a hobby and then that became a career. You know, it's funny. Uh, we have a little bit of something in common. When I got into comics, it was that same phase. Uh, my first comic that I picked up was, a Watch it was Watchmen number one. It was, that, it was that day that it came out and I walked into the comic shop. I kind of feel like I started at a peak, yeah. and it came down for a little while. At least we're back up again. But that's, that was a really interesting time to get into comics. For sure. Laura, ta you know, he's talking about his early days with comics. When were you first exposed to comics? Um, I read, like, Mad Magazine, and I read, like, all the Archie stuff and everything. But um, Great stuff. Yeah. yeah. Especially the Mad Magazine stuff. That was, my, that was actually my first comic book was Mad Magazine. Was I didn't it? think of it as a comic at the time because it was called Mad Magazine. But that's legit comics. 
Oh, and a lot of great artists have worked on Archie, and like Betty and Veronica, and yeah. it's great stuff there. So. so you started there, and then and then wh how old were you? Well, like? Mike brought. I didn't really get into comics until Mike started reading it, and when like Charlie handed him all those books, and he's like, "Look what there is now! Anything you want, you can find." And it that's beautiful artwork and all this stuff. But um, I've been painting since I was eight, and Mike would always. Um, get mad at me because once we got married, we've been together, what, 34 years, and he would say, you've got to do something with your painting, you got to do some art, and so, and he was doing black and white things, and I said, well, if you ever go to color, I'll paint it for you, and that's what happened. And you've really, you've, uh, the, the, you've been coloring comics for long enough that you've seen it change dramatically. You were pre-digital stuff. Started with, yeah. <laughs> where'd, you, where'd you start with, uh, with coloring? Well, um, first we like painted, I don't even know how we did it anymore, with graphic music and... Um, yeah, it was gray line overlays, wow. like I don't painting even direct, she did, well, Dr. Like Martin Dr. dies. Dr. Martin means or something, I don't even remember. And then we, um, you had to paint like a copy the color and then <laughs> code it with all the, yep. with the, oh that was crazy. So the first time we got our big master computer, it was huge. And I think the first thing I ever colored by myself, I mean, did my own separations, was um, Superman, Madman. Oh, yeah. I was trying to find my way how to, and it was hard because nobody really wanted to show you how to do it because it, it was like their job doing separations. And, but we, we got so much help, and people were so nice. In those early days of coloring, as you switch from the, the old style to it's, it, you know, digital, were you satisfied with your work? Because I talked to a number of colors back then. They said, you know, that those first couple of years, there were great tools, but we never felt, like, uh, I'm blanking on the name of the colors I talked to, but he said he never felt like it got it the way it needed to be in that first year because it was such a huge learning curve. Did you experience that too? Well, I feel if Mike's happy, then I did my job. Yeah, <laughs> that's true, that's true. And Let, I, of course it's not perfect. Sure. There's so much I'd like to change, but. Let's talk about your approach to Silver Surfer. Uh, you know, the common assumption I'd make is that coloring Silver Surfer has got to be weird. It's just gray and, and white. But talk about coloring the whole issue and how you approach Silver Surfer specifically and keeping him as dynamic as possible. Well, I don't know if anybody else is doing this, but Mike and I right now, um, anything you see on the page, all the modeling, all the shading, you see like brush strokes. Um, we figured out a way to work together where um, uh, like I'll scan his line art in and then just lay flat colors down, and then I'll rescan, and then he'll paint lush. Um, he'll model it and shade it, and it just looks absolutely beautiful. And then I scan that in, and with that, um, I take all the black out and I make it pure color. So I can take that and make it any color I want. So what it, what you're seeing on the page is all his art. Mm. I'm not messing with the with anything. Mm. So the. The, the, the pencil ink pages look pretty dramatically different, it sounds like, than the finished product. Well, no, no, I don't think so. No, she, she, she's being modest because uh, I'm, I'm colorblind. I have a hard time telling a lot of colors apart. And um, what she does, by this process that we developed, um, I, in, I can, we're, we want it to look as organic as possible, as handmade as possible. And so when she, so I'll, when I do the line art and she scans that, we have that saved. And then I take the original art again, and then I can go crazy on it knowing that she's gonna fix it later. Yeah. And that means uh, I can get in there with uh, washes, gray tones, graphite, textures, use the paper to create textures. And I can take it up or down. The thing is, it's, it's like all the shading, it's just, it's pure color. It's, there's no like grays or anything, it's pure color. But it's, it's all his art. So a, a colorist could take my gray toned original art and color it, but it could look muddy. And mm -hmm. she can take every single texture and turn it into any color she wants. And it's her color sense, which is priceless. Her, her her instincts, the way she combines colors, is it's invaluable, and um, so it's always exciting for me to see what, you know, I do this and then I look at what she's doing and it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's it's fun working together because I I know him so well, <laughs> and doing it and and usually he'll say, um, I was thinking we'd go with a, like this color here. And if he doesn't tell me that, sometimes I'll color it and he goes, you know, I was thinking it was this color. And I'm like, oh, you should have told me that before. <laughs> but, but, um, 
that's usually just like a character, a new character. Like I, I saw him, I thought his skin should be purple, she made it green, but hey, it looks better green, you know? And again, I, if I were to say, and I don't even know what color is really what, I'm, what I like, but most of the time, 99% of the time, she makes it better than what I imagine it. So it's rare when there's something that I thought, in my mind, I saw it more like this, but, right. uh, and, and even more rare when I ask her to change what she's done. Well, but even at the end, Mike can go and look, because we sit right next to each other. <laughs> yeah. He, he could go in and um, look at the whole thing before we turned it in, and he can make little tweaks. So yeah. it, it's, it's fun that way. Pretty cool. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, start, you know, start thinking of them, because we're going to uh, turn to you guys in just a quick second. Did, oh, do you have something? I thought I, thought I saw something. We're going we're gonna to come to you guys in a second. Let's talk about iZombie a little bit. Uh, we'll, we'll get to you. We'll get to you next. Uh, I Zombie. It's filming up in Vancouver right now, I believe. Or it's starting this week, yeah. That's that's now. I'm fascinated by what happened with I Zombie. It's not often that a show. Yeah, <laughs> it's not often that a comic goes from publication to pilot that quickly. It's usually it's usually a much longer gestation period. Talk about the journey you've taken with this and with uh, Chris Roberson, your writer. Um, uh, Shelley Bond is the, uh, at the who's in charge of Vertigo now. She's the first editor I ever had. Mm. Um, when I, I was a TV reporter in Europe, and comics were my hobby. After that love affair I described earlier, and, and uh, um, d the I got a uh, with Steve Siegel got a twelve issue contract through Kamiko for a book called Jaguar Stories, mm -hmm. and um, so that was how I had the courage to. Stop being a TV reporter, move back to the States and do comics full time. Kamika went chapter 11, panic. And always, have, always having Laura's support, knowing how, how much I wanted to do this. And so, it was, but this relationship with Shelly always stayed. He, so even though she was with Kamiko, she then did other things for a while, ended up going to DC, and we are where we are now. But all along the way, she's always trying to find stuff that we can do together. And um, uh, she had an idea this concept that Chris Roberson had and presented it to me thinking that I might like it. And I said, what if we did this, this, this? And she went back to Chris, he loved my ideas, bang, you know, instant romance. And uh, so we just went from there and um, uh, it, it, it was just a really strange experience because um, just about everything I've done has either been optioned uh, for, for uh, you know, a film or a TV series, but Rarely does anything happen. I mean, one of the earliest things I ever did is the only thing that ever got made into a movie, and that's G Men from Hell, mm. which Christopher Coppola directed. He's Nicholas Cage's older brother. Right, right. Nicholas right. Cage was almost Cheetah Man in that movie. Really? This close. Yeah. <laughs> that was a scheduling thing. But um, that's on Netflix, by the way, if, if you haven't seen it. And uh, it seems like every time I've been involved, nothing ever happens. And the, the, the happiest example of that is with Robert Rodriguez, who's had uh, the rights to Madman since 1997 or 98. And uh, we keep, I, I really feel that when and if that happens, it'll be just very satisfying. But um, in the meantime, just with uh, iZombie's like, I don't even ask me. I'm just, if anything happens, fine. And the next thing I know, it's being turned into a TV show. So. Um, so the lesson for me is just keep my mouth shut and stay, <laughs> stay, out, of, stay out of the room. Are you guys going to go up and visit the set or anything when they're filming? Um, it'd be fun, but uh, I got so much stuff that I want to get done. And, and uh, I, I really am in my happy place with Silver Surfer. And, and I've got a Madman 3D special that, that we're working on that I'm um, excited about. And so seeing and those pages converted. Me. Oh, yeah. And in, in, in May. Uh, right. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. So I've done all the, the cover, for all the DC comics, there's a variant cover that I did all in one month. Yeah, 19 comics, uh, uh, 19 covers, right? Well, I did 22, and uh, uh, some are gonna be used elsewhere. I'm not sure exactly okay. sure where, but yeah, that was a blast. And that, that was through Mark Chirello. Yeah. Um, so Shelley and Mark DC, every time I get a phone call from them, I know it's gonna be a good time. I mean, Mark brought DC Solo to me, Wednesday, Wednesday Comics. Comics. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and he, he's also one of my two editors on, well, Jim Chadwick's the editor on Batman 66, and Mark is also my go-to there, too. That, those, those Batman 66-inspired covers that you're doing in May, just 
I'm surprised somebody hasn't thought of doing something like that with you or doing a Mike Allred style, retro style covers for a long time. I pushed as, as long as 10 years ago, really? thinking that, there, uh, that I knew for a fact there was people that would love something like that. And you see Else Worlds and all this stuff and things would pop up. But uh, I had a Batman and Go-Go, a story that I was um, pushing at least 10 years ago and uh, came close to happening. It was right after I did um, uh, Superman Madman. Mm -hmm. And um, it, so obviously it didn't happen, but then DC Solo happened. It was like, well, that's a great chance to bring um, Batman and Go-Go back. And then I brought in my brother Lee, who took my ideas. and. Lee and I, I mean, there's home movies of us running around in Batman capes and stuff. And Oh, I need and, those. I need that video. <laughs> <laughs> there's a photograph in the, it was in the Comics Journal. I think it's in the, uh, the Modern Masters volume of mine that you see us in, in these Batman plot. But with Batman, uh, Batman uh, buttons. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it, it's a huge part of our childhood. And, and now that Adam West and I are like this, yeah. um, I, you know, I, I told him he was like a second dad to me. He, I loved him so much. And, and uh, I first met him in New York a few years ago, but this just a few weeks ago met Burt Ward for the first time. And so anyway, I've been pushing and pushing. And then with DC Solo, I did, uh, the original cover was uh, an Adam West Batman doing the Batusi. And it was in the solicitation, solicitation catalogs and everything. But, but then they made you block the eyes out. Yeah. Well, at the last second, was they, they panicked thinking, um, it looked too much like Adam was. Rights issues, they didn't have yeah. the rights, and uh, so we'll get the rights. Well, they got the rights and contacted me, and uh, um, I, I couldn't do anything more than covers at the time. I was doing FF and in my happy place there. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's again another example of why I prefer to travel as little as possible because I just love being creative and uh, um, I love being different places. It's just the getting there that would rather not do and would rather be in my studio or, or in, in my, but uh, anyway, it's just a thrill to, to see that realized, for them to get the likeness rights to all of the actors and, and see them getting this, this new spotlight and the new toys and, yeah. and the TV show is finally gonna be available on disc. And so it, it's, it's just beyond my wildest dreams to be a part of all this. Isn't it interesting how that series for a while in comics, uh, I'd say in the mid to late 90s, comics didn't really embrace that series until more recently. We, 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 you know, it, it inspired all the Biff Bam Pow headlines in mainstream media, which we was like, that's not comics anymore. And that was never really comics. That was that TV show. And we kind of pushed it away. But now we're embracing it again. I think that's really cool because it is part of comics culture. I never pushed it away. <laughs> Good, for Good for you. Good for you. Oh, it, it, for me, I, I love all kinds of, for me, it's, if, it's, if it's good, I love it. And um, I don't care if it's dark and gritty and, and scary or creepy or weird, or if it's light and fun and goofy. Okay. I, I can find quality in any genre and any style, and, and I get excited about that. And, and every time somebody does push in a different direction or, or find their own niche, it's, uh, it's just thrilling for me, and I celebrate it. Cool. Uh, there was a question over here. <laughs> else you go, first, uh, right? hey, go ahead. Uh, for Silver Surfer, how much uh, influence do you have in storytelling? Does Dan just say, draw awesome Silver Surfer? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt. I have to repeat the question so that it gets okay. heard on the video. Uh, he wants to know how much say you have in the story with Dan on Silver Surfer. It's all me. <laughs> yeah, I just, Someone uh, tweet that to Dan right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I felt sorry for Dan. I felt that you know he, he's just known as the Spider-Man guy. And, <laughs> And I thought, you know, let's let's give him a little encouragement elsewhere. So we just put his name on the book. Is, you know. but no, Dan, with Dan, it's it's uh, it's like being, you know, it was, it's exactly like how it was with me and my older brother sitting on our grandma and grandpa's porch making our own comics. When when I talk with him, we just get really excited about what we can do with it and what hasn't been done and should have been done, and and uh, and every idea that Dan has just gets me excited and. Um, he's been very receptive to my ideas, but truthfully, uh, uh, I, I can just stand out of the way. And Dan is, I mean, we have uh, uh, it, it mapped out for uh, 25 issues. And I can tell you that if you stick with it, we're, uh, we're going to take you to some wonderful places and so introduce you to some wonderful new characters. And, but yeah, Dan is on fire. I, I'm so excited to, to 
we, we, we're, we're just perfect chemistry. And uh, it, it's so exciting to hear his ideas and, and know what, what um, it, it, like you'll ask, do, would you like to draw this? I'm like, yes. <laughs> so he, he's, he's just uh, fueling me with, with phenomenal stuff. And um, I, I don't have to contribute much, to be honest, because it, it's like he's reading my mind. He, he knows what, what I would love to do. And, and I'm just e excited to get to each issue. And, and there again, that's why, uh, you know, I, I, it'd be a blast to go watch. I mean, I've done that. You know, I, uh, R Robert Rodriguez has his own Disneyland in Austin, and and we, our our daughter was a spy kid, and um, that, that's fun. I really enjoy that. But but uh, if it's a if it's a choice between going somewhere and you know watching cameras and and actors, which I, again I love, but I love being at my drawing table even more. Do you feel the same way? Do you do you? Do you prefer to just be at home and creating versus traveling around the world? Or do you like to travel? No, I love to travel, but I prefer and to be at home. And we have. Yeah. Yeah. We have so much fun when, we, when we're when we out places meeting just really great people. But um, at home is such a cozy place. Our oldest son lives across the street. We have two grandkids that live across the street. Our daughter and her husband and our other little granddaughter live with us. They're saving money to buy a house. And then our other son lives about a mile away with our other grandson. and. We socialize with our family daily. Yeah. So it's a good little happy place. It's yeah, it's our favorite place to be with favorite stuff to do. I, I grew my own partridge family. They have a band. I, yeah, I have a band. <laughs> I have Mike a bought me a piano for Christmas, so I'm I'm taking lessons again. Yeah. Cool. So there's just a lot of music and um, and we're the the gear. Our band is uh, we're on our third album and it's it's just there's we're never lacking for things to do. And plus, Mike works all the time. He, I he never like, work. I don't know what she's talking about. It, it's, <laughs> the, our granddaughter walked into I know, the studio. I know. I used to work. I don't work. Yeah. But she it, walked into his no, studio. No work. And he, was, he wasn't there. I think he was riding his bike. But she was, like, shocked because, like, where is he? Because he's always, <laughs> always there. <laughs> I, 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 correct me. Something happened with your house a couple years ago. Uh, a fire or a break-in? What? No, break-in. It was Why almost exactly a year ago. How it's okay? Awesome. So, so somebody broke in your house and stole everything, right? They stole all our electronics. Um, I begged Laura for a big seventy-inch television, and then these guys. They I, took and it. I know it was at least two guys because it'd like take at least two guys, to, and they hauled it down. The the back part of her house is this ivy slope mm -hmm. in the the one area that isn't lit. And so he told them he went out and bought an eighty-inch. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How bad was it? To, did you guys lose any files? Did you lose any? We lost everything. everything. Our and backups, externals. And then we think they got scared off because um, our whole house there was like piles of stuff, like they were going to come back and get, and stuff they dropped outside, like they got spooked or something. Okay. So um, just everything out of our closets, everything out of our drawers, like right. walking on our bed, and it was awful. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Since you work in traditional media, you probably still have a lot of that work, but. You lost a lot of work through that, didn't you? Oh my gosh! All my swa 20 years of swatches I had everybody's like eye color, skin color that I liked. I mean, every bit. I, but that's not as bad as losing our our family photos. But still, my I have a you know a Cintiq, and then I have a big monitor, and they were like perfectly synced up. Mm -hmm. And then once, and then like oh, they took that, so I lost my swatches, and I couldn't get the color right on this one to match this one, and. And you're on tech support like all the time, and trying to be on tech support is like, ugh. yeah. I think we spent like, it, it took us back a month. Yeah. Wow, that's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that, but you, you're back. You're but back. we're over yeah. that. You're back. We're past yeah. it. Moving like on. I, I, my goal was to do every single issue of FF, and fortunately, my very, very good friend and one of my very favorite artists, Joe Quinones, um, stepped in, and uh, I love the issues that he did, and uh, so as a fan, uh, that that is. I'm always trying to look at the bright side of things. <laughs> sure. So because of that, I got two issues of uh, Joe Quinones, you know, and uh, in, in among our stuff, and that was a good thing. And one of the great things about the comics industry and the comics community is that they rally. When something like that happens, something bad happens to somebody in, in our business, everybody rallies. And I oh, DC, Image, support. Marvel, they immediately came back with what they had. So we restored um, at least those files. But there, were, you know, there was a lot of little stuff that, it, um, you know, drawings mm -hmm. that I'll never see again, yeah. uh, unless you know whoever has them. And we them. lost a lot of contacts. Um, we people that we used to email and stuff. Yeah, we I'm still finding. I'll go to email somebody, and it's 
it's not there, so I'll have to call a publisher or somebody else who I know knows them. Right. That's still happening. So wow. a year later, I'm still kind of finding that now. I don't, I, you know, I, I have to work around. So it's just the inconvenience of time. And, sure. and uh, so initially, it's the, the shock. And you hear about, and I've heard people who've suffered loss. I mean, and Eric Larson, who lost everything in a fire. Yeah. Um, that um, so yeah, I count my blessings. It, this could have been much worse. Yeah, they didn't take any comics. They could have taken a couple comics and got off better than oh they yeah. Took. But then that, that's any. that's that seven-inch TV is worth nothing. <laughs> <to those laughs> no, that's that's truly hilarious. I I can see they them sweating and 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 <laughs> and panicking when if they had just taken these three comic books, they, I just hope our they could have anonymously sold them at a, and made more money. Yeah, I just and I know how much Cheetah money they made on some of the we, electronics. We have Cheetah Man from the, the movie. It was in our um, hallway. On a mannequin. Yeah. And so I'm hoping when they came up, they kind of, you know, got That's really spooky. scared. Wet, <laughs> wet their pants a little bit. <laughs> it didn't scare them enough. It didn't scare them enough. Yeah. Uh, all right, any more questions from the audience here? Go ahead, sir. So what were a few of those uh, old comics when you woke up that were on the hospital? What were some of those comments oh, on the hospital one. bed? They're like n n nothing uh, like uh, I can only think of the cover right now. One of the ones that, that I just bought is uh, it's an old action comic with uh, um, Superman is an alternate Superman underwater, and there's this guy with a big yellow head. Um, I can't remember the issue number or anything, but it, it, it wasn't anything that you would go, it was exactly this. They're, they're kind of obscure, which is why I was. We Happy that Lee, Lee could remember what some of them were. But I don't think he did remember what a lot of them were. Yeah, but the, and they were bought at the gift shop. And talk about the good old days when a hospital gift shop would sell comic books. Right, right. You know, yeah, now hopefully comic book stores will be in hospitals. That's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that might be my next uh, It's Thank interesting. We might be talking. Uh, anybody else? Go ahead. Okay, I'm ready now. You're ready now. So aside from just how beautiful your artwork is, my favorite thing about the comics you do is I never feel the disconnect between artist and writer when you're working with someone else. And the characters are always engaged. Like I always feel all your characters, FF, you have this huge cast, and no one's posing, you know? Everyone is engaged in their own story. How much of that is intuition, and how much of that are you consciously planning? I don't know that I can repeat that question, so I'm just going to let you go. Well, at, go for at, it. at this point, everything is intuition and instinct, it, uh, um, and that's why it's more fun than ever because it's kind of a struggle early on trying to figure out, uh, w w you know, when do I go with the, you know, you're, you're, you hope you're making the right decisions. Now it just, it, it's very instinctual and it's therapeutic in that way. Just. Uh, you know, the story's there. First thing I do when I get a script is I'll just do a quick thumbnail on the, the script page so that my first impressions are right there. And that way, I think, is the best way to be the most faithful to what the, the, the writer is wanting to do. And I love co collaboration, sometimes more than doing my own work, which I love writing my own stuff. But the collaborations always stretch me and take me somewhere else I wouldn't normally go. And... Um, and and it, there's always, I've been lucky so far, the chemistry is always there. And so when the, the, I'm reading the story, I, I can see it. I can see how I want th that panel to look. And so I just do it. Uh, it's like uh, shorthand. You know, somebody else could look at that thumbnail at me. It's like a five second, if that. And then I go to the next one and the next one. And then I'll go back and, and flesh it out. And then I'll do a, uh, a, a little thumbnail of the whole page so I can feel the flow of the page and do I need to bring that person closer and and usually it, the first instinct seems to be right there now and and um, so I feel like I'm now reaping the rewards of all the initial study and and trying new things and I'm always trying to experiment too when I did uh, Madman Atomic Comics every issue there was a conscious um, attempt at, at an experiment something I'd never done before even if it was subtle or even if it was something big and obvious, like having each panel look like a different artist drew it. Yeah, well, or, he's, he's always trying to um, say if you if you always trying to progress and make things better, make things. He's, and he's, collaborations are a great way to yeah. do that. Would you say if you think you're as good as you? What's that saying? If, if you if you think you're as good as you can be, then you are. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> uh, 
And following your career for, how long have you been in comics? Is that, I've been following you for about 20 years. My uh, officially began drawing full-time January of 1990. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, over 20. Thanks to her. There you go. Yeah. And, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, but the creative um, relationship began the moment we met. So we've, we have literally been together since the moment we met. How do you mean the creative relationship has been together? I just feel like with Laura, there's just, um, she inspires me. So I'm always wanting to, I want her to be proud of me. <laughs> That's awesome. That's whoo. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna. I want to say something about watching your career over the years. Uh, for, in the in the early days, you were labeled an indie artist. You had a very specific style that was not at all quote mainstream or anything like that. And I think you're one of the few, quote, indie artists. <laughs> oh. um, you're one of the few indie artists who went from being kind of labeled or uh, uh, what's the, uh, typecast as an indie artist to now you are Mike Allred. Not every indie artist makes that jump. Um, you are as mainstream as anybody else. You have your specific style. Is that something you went after consciously, or is that something that just happened organically? Does that, does that make sense? Do you see what I'm getting at there? I, I do. It's all been a, one big happy accident because truly if, if, uh, if Marvel and, or, or DC back in the day had said, a, you know, come draw Batman, come draw, you know, Spider-Man, um, I would, would have. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know how to get through those doors. Yeah. And so, um, and I had wrote a, a screenplay called Dead Air and my friend Charlie Custis who gave me those comics in the 80s, um, said, uh, I like I started storyboarding my screenplay idea. He said, turn it into a comic book. And so I did. And um, uh, so rather than wait or, or try to figure out how to get a, a mainstream job, I just did my own stuff. Yeah. And um, completed my graphic novel by the time, I mean, with Slave Labor Graphics, happily picked it up because it was done. All they had to do was solicit it. So I didn't know about, you know, doing a three-page sample and a proposal. And I just did it. He didn't know the proper way to just and, and then from there, it was like, do you, have, he, do you have other days, ideas? Yes, I do. So uh, just continue from there. And then um, by the, uh, yeah, so I, I, when I was doing graphic music, then all of a sudden I was getting phone calls and, uh, or collaborating with, like Bernie Moreau is one of my favorite artists, mm -hmm. underrated, did a character called The Jam. I, I think and I hope that Image is doing a big uh, collection of it. But some of the most innovative stuff you'll ever see, and he's so, there nobody draws like Bernie Moreau. And that's largely been a problem for him. I love, he's like a Jack Kirby, but on the other end of the success spectrum where people, not enough people are getting it, I think he's a genius mm -hmm. and um, hopefully, you know, people will discover, but um, we did a, a one-shot for Epic. Marvel, Marvel used to have a creator online called mm -hmm. Epic, and we did a one-shot called The Everyman, and uh, that was optioned by George Clooney's production company, for example, one mm -hmm. of these things that, again, just never happened. But, mm -hmm. um, and so, it's just, and then going to shows. Um, Matt Wagner was the first professional to reach out to me. He was living in San Jose at the time, which is where slave labor is, and, uh, so he was going, Dan Votto, who is the publisher, has a comic shop, and Matt would go in there, and Dan was showing him my stuff. Out of the blue, I get a postcard from Matt Wagner. Hey, Dan showed me his stuff. Think it's great. Um, you know, give me a call if, if, whenever. He gave me his phone. He didn't know who I was. And on this postcard, his phone number. So, so I called him, <laughs> and, you know, from Germany. But that's another thing in what we love about the comic art form and being in comics is artists promote artists yeah. and writers. If they have they have their favorite artists and will say, like Matt, you know, hey, I loved your stuff. It right. helped. Yeah, it's uh, it's such a, and especially early on, you, like the first Seattle show we ever went to, there were like ten guests, so the the convention organizer would have a big dinner and we're all there. I mean, to do that now, they'd have to be a big banquet hall to get all the guests mm -hmm. in there, but. 
but you, er, so early on, you meet everybody. Yeah. So our first Seattle convention, we're at a dinner table with John Romita Jr., for instance, you know, and so you, you meet him and get to know him. And it was just like that and echoed out. And getting to meet um, Matt Wagner, his um, brother-in-law, um, Bob, Shrek. Bob Shrek, and and uh, so all of these people have remained our best friends, and they told us about the shows we needed to go to and how to do it, and mm. and uh, so it just kind of uh, echoed out from there, and and so you start meeting people. Which if 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 I was to give advice to anybody, it would just be always do what excites you, so that you're encouraged to keep doing it, which will increase your skills, which makes it more fun, which keeps you doing it, and it's you know just just keep getting better because you love doing it yeah. and then beyond that show up yeah. be there with your work and then if you dig do get an offer make sure you do what you say you're going to do and have a professional attitude and and work ethic and you, you to me if, if the talent's there and the desire is there you're, you'll be successful but it is a matter of you, you do start to meet people and if your work is good they're going to find you yeah. and they'll call you and and think of you when you know this person might be good for this job yeah. and then and then and that so that's how the uh, the how uh, boy this has been a long answer to it so <laughs> no it's good it's but good. but uh yeah so i've always but it been took you a long time to get that quote mainstream acceptance uh, or or to become mike allred the artist versus mike allred the indie artist i was lucky um uh, full-time career began in 1990 by 1992 kevin eastman plucked me from obscurity with my madman idea and um, and then Dark Horse took that and blew it up, and so within two four years I was completely independent, where I didn't have to worry about um, the next job or or making money. I, we were comfortable. We never had to worry about making money. <laughs> well, not it wasn't like we were panicking. You know, where um, you know we were, we were able to make uh, relatively established, and knowing how to keep it going. And so, of course, we're, to this day, we worry about bills and, and that. But at least I know that what I'm capable of and, and I have a skill that's marketable, you know, looking on the realistic side of things. And, and um, so that's been a blessing. But also knowing that um, if, if somebody isn't calling with an idea to collaborate, I can do my own stuff, which I happily do. And I continue to try to get at least a, a, a Madman special out a year. And... Uh, but the collaborations have been so satisfying and enriching and, and feel like I'm growing and stretching and progressing, working with other brains and having other ideas presented to me and, and that back and forth. Um, it's what I prefer to do right now. So um, it's, it's... You're having a blast. Man. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah, I, I am. Tell. And, and, I, I, and if, I, if I'm really Jones into to do more Madman or Atomics or another project like Red Rocket 7, I can and I do. I will just kind of work at it in my spare time. And he has no spare time. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, we are out of time. I could talk to you guys for another hour. Thank you so much. You guys are both unbelievably lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Mike and Laura Allred. No, it was a happy coincidence. She was an art major at the same time I was, but um, by the time I was doing comics, we'd been together 10 years. And um, so when I had the first opportunity for a color book, and because I have a color deficiency problem, it was just turning to her, knowing she had the skills, and asking her if, you, if she would do it, and she was willing to do it. And it, it just it started there. And so she's been my go-to for this long. Relationship came, was well established. Oh, yeah. Before the working oh, yeah. yeah we've, we've been together 34 years. That's so crazy. Yeah. You guys don't look old enough to be together for 34 years. That was my first time. <laughs> <laughs> and you have grandkids. I was They're like, married. did they meet in grade school? You have four grandkids. <laughs> we have four, nine, six, five, and one. Thank you. you guys, if I can age as well as you guys do, I'll be.
pretty happy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.